Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. My friend and colleague, David Cohen, is also a member of the Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches, and his focus is helping organizations build authentic employee experiences by focusing on articulating the behaviors that define a company's culture and values. He's earned the moniker of the contrarian consultant. I'll be interested to learn more about that one, David, because he doesn't always go along with what is popular and he dares to say so. And for me, that is demonstrated in the title of the book we're gonna be discussing, Inside the Box, Leading with Corporate Values to Drive Sustained Business Success. So David, welcome to People First. Pleasure being here, thank you for inviting me. So before we get inside the box, I wanna ask about your origin story because the leadership journey we're all on is often a winding path. So when you go back to when you were a wee lad, you're at elementary school, the teacher's asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? What's your answer? What was my answer back then was probably be a baseball player. Mm -hmm. Because that's what I thought about um, most of the time. <laughs> and then as I evolved, um, I got involved in politics very early in young age. And um, I thought I would either go into politics or be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. People still think I'm a lawyer because of the way I dress sometimes and look. They said, were you a lawyer first? I said, no, I just played one on TV. Um, and they, uh, as that evolved, as university evolved, I decided um, that what happened back in high school, actually, and then continued through college is I was very much involved with uh, journalism, and I thought I'd become a sports writer and became editor of the college newspaper. I started my freshman year. By the end of the freshman year, I was editor of the sports page, the sports section, and then became in the middle of my junior year the editor-in-chief of the paper. I was doing work with ABC, Wide World of Sports, regional football game with Chuck Howard. And so I thought I would go into journalism. And then for some reason in my senior year, decided I was going to rabbinical school and become a rabbi. Oh. And, and then decided that I really wanted to work with kids. So I'd leave that after two years and go into education, which I did. During that time, just before that time, I also finished a doctorate in humanistic and behavioral studies focused on um, corporate organizational behavior and well, as well as adolescent behavior. Did work in uh, schools for a number of years until I couldn't stand parents anymore. Mm -hmm. um, was working with a number of uh, private Jewish day schools. Had moved to Toronto, Canada for the one that invited me up here. It was doing really great. There were some issues going on. I said, I don't need this aggravation. I'm going to change jobs. And keeping with the theme of doing, following my path, which has always been there, of doing the right thing, values, ethics, um, got involved, got a job offer um, fairly quickly at Hay Management and Organization of Management Development in 1985. And Back then, it was about leadership development, which was just beginning to come to fruition. And so we really didn't know what we were doing. So we called it, or they called it organization management development. We called it OMD, Orchestrative Movements in the Dark. <laughs> I was going to say, wasn't that a good band? <laughs> yes, that's what we called it. And then um, a couple of years later, um, kicked around with a couple of small consulting firms. And in 91, went out on my own and mm -hmm. really been focused on helping organizations understand what are the behaviors that drive the highly successful, what differentiates a highly successful employee from an average or even successful employee, and really yeah. focused on behavior. So it all goes back to, and the common thread is always, you know, what's doing the right thing? What is, you know, what is your story? What is your purpose in life? And how do you make it happen? 
So there is no doubt that you know what you're doing now because you're a sought out speaker, you're a sought out guest on podcasts like People First and a prolific writer. And I am really looking forward to diving in to Inside the Box. And that's the first thing that struck me. I mean, we are told throughout our school life and our work life to start thinking outside of the box. So what was the inspiration for the title where you actually challenge us to think inside the box? Yeah, especially back then when I was writing the book in the late 90s, inside the box was, you know, that as thinking outside the box, corporate innovation and all this continuous improvement process was going on. But what I realized was that every organization has its own culture and values. And within that, no two organizations have the same culture and values. They might both have respect, but the nuance of the behaviors that describe it are going to be different. Even in organizations that are in the same industry, in the same geography across the street from each other. And I was working with two chemical plants uh, that were actually in that situation out in what's known as the Chemical Valley in Sarnia, Ontario. And I realized they were the same thing, and they, but they were very different. And so um, I said, the name of the book has to be Inside the Box. The mm-hmm. concept being, you can have as much innovative thinking and outside the box thinking you want about strategy and delivery and whatever it is. But when it comes to trusting one another as employees, when it comes to doing the right thing, that's about following the, the corporate code of ethics, which is founded in the values. So I came up with the idea of inside the box. Now, that also went very well as I started to write the book because of my own family history. My father and grandfather both were in the box business. Uh, my grandfather was in the folding box business, and my father was in the corrugated box business. And they both had companies. And as I talked to my family about it, inside the box thinking and how people need to follow values and behaviors, I learned of a couple of stories that I never knew about before. And one begins the book and the other ends the book. So tell me about the story that begins the book, because that's what caught my attention as we drove in, as you reflected on the learnings from your father and your grandfather that informed inside the box. Well, um, the one in the beginning, is that the one about my grandfather? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I thought so. Um, As I said, my entire life, I had no choice because of my parents. My entire life is focused on doing the right thing, social justice, and speaking up when nobody else did. To the point where my father, before he ever met my mother, um, spoke up during World War II when he was a sergeant in the U.S. military, he wrote letters to the editor of the Army magazine, Yank, about how America was, you know, had to get rid of its Jim Crow laws and had to involve, you know, start to be a, treat people as people. And um, my mother told me this story, then uh, I had it validated by two other members of the family. During World War II, my grandfather's box company was very successful. And my mother was sort of working with him in summers. And most of the men in the factory had either volunteered or got drafted into the military. So they were shorthanded. And finding employees was very difficult. And this is in, outside of Newark, Elizabeth, New Jersey. And what my mother did, what my father, my grandfather told my mother to do, is to go to downtown Newark into the black the neighborhood, the African-American black neighborhood, and recruit people. And if they don't have transportation to get there, they'll arrange a bus every day at a certain time to pick them all up and bring them in. They're going to get paid the same salary as everybody else and the same working conditions. So my mother went down there and she found lots of people who wanted to sign up because it was a great job opportunity at a good wage. And when they got to the factory, uh, the white workers rebelled, the fit women. The women wanted a separate bathroom, they wanted a separate lunch area, and they wanted all this other stuff, which was quite predictable in 1942, 43. And my grandfather stood there in front of everybody, all of everybody, and said, these are people just like you and me. They're here to help keep us afloat and make us continuous to be successful. 
And I am not going to create a second bathroom because you all go to the bathroom together and you all eat lunch together. And if you don't like it, quit. And a number of them quit. And many reluctantly didn't quit because they needed a job. And my mother tells a story that within three, four months, they're exchanging recipes, eating together and getting to know each other's families. And all of a sudden, all of that fear melted away because it was based on false information. So that's basically the gist of the story. And it's a powerful story that I think shows in your retelling there the mistake that many organizations make between the gap between words and actions because there are every company has its stated values we've seen the posters but then we've also heard the water cooler conversations of what it's really like to work here or how that's lip service for some other group within the organization but not for this group yeah that's why that gap continues because there's leadership behavior Mm -hmm. I I call it overt and covert behaviors. Okay, tell me more. Okay, so in in overt behaviors, that's stuff on the website and on the boardroom wall. And every time an employee goes by it, they kind of scoff and become cynical. And as one focus group was doing many years ago, one of the younger employees was here, one of the newer employees was hearing the more longer term employees talk about the values and these glowing terms and these behaviors. And she and another person um, who didn't share a common manager with some of the others um, started giving stories that were quite the opposite. And one of the people that really liked working there, been working there a long time, said, why are you so cynical? And the response led to a title of an article I wrote, Earn Cynicism. Said by their behavior, management has earned my cynicism. Mm-hmm. So I I understand that there's those things which we espouse to. They look nice. The consultant came in and told them to put them up there. Where we looked at the you know best companies to work for, they have those values. We have plagiarized them literally. We put them up there, but we don't live them. So there's a covert set of values. What truly, when nobody's looking, how do we behave towards each other? Usually as a new employee, we learn that not at the um, onboarding process, not at orientation when somebody talks about the Mm -hmm. values. We learn about them when we're about to do something and a colleague near us who likes us says, oh, don't do that. That's not the way we do things around here. Mm -hmm. And now they're beginning to learn the covert set of values. It's the covert set of values that drive success. And so what happens is leaders sometimes come into organizations that feel they have to put their stamp on things. And so they're gonna come in and they're gonna create a new, better culture, uh, hipper culture, whatever it might be, without realizing the organization's culture is just fine. It's the strategic plan, the delivery, something that is technical is Mm -hmm. missing. People love working there. They love working there because the way they're treated because of the behaviors. And so there's an overt set of culture, overt and covert set of, and about what I call above ground and underground set of values. And when you're above ground and when they're synchronous and the same, you have a healthy organization. Mm -hmm. What you say is what you do. Now, here's another problem. And I recently had this with a client. Um, Leadership want to have aspirational, call the values aspirational. And I said, you can't call them aspirational because if they're your values, they're strongly held beliefs, emotionally charged, resistant to change, and universally applied. So it's the same set of actions for everybody in the organization, from the CEO to the front line, the intern, everybody's got to behave the same. And if they're aspirational, Well, what happened was is the leadership made a decision and the decision did not appear to the rank of the majority of the organization to be aligned with the values. And when I talked with the CEO, he said, well, they're aspirational. We don't have to use them in every situation or some values are more important than other values. I said, no, all your values are of equal importance. There's no hierarchy. 
So he says, well, sometimes one value is better to use than the other, but we have to violate the other to use this value, and we call them aspirational. Yeah. And I said, well, you're confusing your, you know, your inmates because yeah. they don't see it that way. And they've never acted. It's a 60 year old organization, very strong set of stories, wonderful stories to exemplify living the values over the years. Oh, and so. Stories are one thing, but we've also seen the headlines when um, corporate values have gone wild. I mean, you have to think about Volkswagen and many others where ethics and integrity, et cetera, stated values but behaviors become optional or deprioritized and it ends up as a headline news. It has, and that's it. They will end up as headline news because if they had made, and that's why I always tell my clients, the leadership team, when they're making a decision, has to always ask the question, is this decision consistent with our values? And if the answer is no, you don't change your values, you change, change the decision. Yes. But there's a lot of organizations that don't do that. Yeah. But I, I do have a question, David, in terms of the aspirational piece, because the values that we inherit in an organization may not always remain true for the future. And you think about the transition in the 21st century, we're in a digital knowledge economy, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, whereas many long-standing companies whose values may be rooted back in the original industrial re revolution no longer hold fray. And of course, 2020 has also had a huge impact on how we experience um, being part of an organization. So what should leaders be thinking about now in terms of the values that they are holding true in a more distributed work environment? Well, there's two aspects to that. Let me talk about the one that's the ongoing one first. Mm -hmm. If See, a lot of people call a value a word, use a word that's not a value. It's okay. associated with a business strategy. Innovation is one of them. Because you're not always going to be innovative. It's a way of currently creating a more advanced, stable, capturing the market, whatever it might be. Customer service is not a value. As I told one, one I was told once by uh, the HR team, if I tell the executive team customer service is not a value, they'll show me the door. And But I had evidence that it wasn't a value. It was a utility, a gas utility. And the gas utility basically had a rule that if you called up, you smelled gas, they would, depending on how you answered the questions, they knew they can come there 24 hours later. But the staff always was concerned about that because it sounded like a babysitter or an elderly couple that didn't understand what they were telling them. Mm -hmm. And so they had to respond to it differently. Also, that... There was all sorts of other things going on around customer service. So I challenged the CEO when he brought up customer service. I said, you don't have customer services. He got really stern. And I said, well, ask your head of the call center who was sitting next to him, what's the response time to various phone calls? And if I'm a customer and I smell gas and you tell me you're showing up 24 hours later, that's not customer service because in customer service, the customer is always right. And the customer is not always right. And so, unless you're Nordstrom's, uh, and the reality is that they had an hour and a half conversation. It was a fascinating debate. And they came up with customer care. We care about our customers, which means we will educate our customers. They also found out by calling customer care, they didn't have to respond immediately to certain calls. And they cut their use of external help down by over 70%. And in the first year alone, by going with their value of customer care, customer education, they actually saved $7 million in calls. $7 so, million. You know, million? And this is back in 1988, mm -hmm. right? So the reality is, is that we use a lot of words, and this is always my concern. Whenever people talk about values and culture, everybody has their own understanding and definition. So I always ask somebody, which annoys a lot of people, um, 
like, what is your definition of culture? And they assume that everybody has the same. I said, I don't have the same one you do. And I definitely don't have the one as a value. So I separate those words that are associated with strategy from the words associated with values. Mm -hmm. Values will not change. And the way I explain that is really simple. It's, you know, you have a young child, your children are older, you know, they're over six foot, but they're not, you know, they were young ones, believe it or not. And they're probably around two, three years of age and they're crawling around doing something. And all of a sudden, without thinking, it's a knee jerk reaction. You say something to them and this little voice in the back of your head says, oh my God, I promise when I was a parent, I never say that. I am now my parents. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because of socialization. That's because we have adopted. In adolescence, we, you know, we, we, uh, we go through life in up to age about 12 or 13, accepting what our parents tell us. Through the high school years, college years, we question everything we heard. And then we go back to somewhere between those two extremes. Most people go back to their parents' belief system. That's why, you know, I grew up in the 60s, and they always say, I went to university in the 60s. And they say anybody went to university in the 60s who remembers it probably really didn't go to the university in the 60s, but I did. Um, and we had all these wonderful ideas, and we thought that we were going to change corporate culture and change the way corporations dealt with people, and yet women were treated poorly, People of color were treated poorly, and those daycare centers never happened until much later. No. Because people went back to their values. It's like a rubber band effect, right? They go back to their values. So what happens is, if I have always believed in the dignity of human life, as the values, such as Starbucks does, it doesn't matter if it's 1890, 1990, or 2090, that, those behaviors that define dignity of human life are going to be the same. So when somebody is off virtually working because of COVID, and if you are not setting up policies and procedures and following your behaviors of human dignity, you are confusing your employees. Mm -hmm. That's why I say now more than ever, you have to understand what your values are, not your strategic plan issues, but what your values are and be consistent with them. And most leaders don't know what their values are or they think they do, but the employees see it differently because there is an overt and covert set of values. So now, the second part, mm -hmm. which is going to be real confusing to people, and I've already seen this with a couple of organizations, this is an experience which is unlike any other we've ever had in the last hundred years. And there's a concept called significant emotional events in our life. And when we account, so values will stay the same, they'll evolve very slowly. I always laugh when somebody says they're coming in to change the corporate culture. I always tell the people working there, get your resume out there. If you love working there, find a new job that is similar to the one you're working at now, the environment. Uh, because changing your culture means changing your values. So, because they're really not going to change their values. And if they do, it, it becomes bad. A significant emotional event is something that hits us without us even knowing it. So when I was doing work with North York General Hospital, they were the hardest hit hospital in Canada for SARS. And they had a set of values, which they're very proud of, and they more or less follow those behaviors than SARS hit. And within two months, everybody in the organization says, we allow this to happen because this was our norms of behavior. We have to have a completely different set of norms. It was the only time I've seen an organization instantaneously change its values. And it changes values from the top up. And everybody agreed with it, everybody aligned with it, and everybody understood it. We are going through a similar significant emotional event. And I believe that there are leaders out there that are seeing the world differently. And life is more precious than they ever thought it was. And while they might have valued teamwork before, they're actually valuing people now. 
Mm-hmm. They're valuing relationships now, but they're not telling their employees that. So their employees are behaving under this old set of behaviors, and the unarticulated new set of behaviors is is the realization the s the significant emotional event behaviors, and they're wondering why employees aren't doing that. They got to stand up and say, you know, we've always operated this way, and because of this event, I realize we can come become better than we are. That's where that's. So I don't care whether it's the industrial revolution, one, two, three, or four. If you identify your values, one of my my longest term client, and I'm very proud of it since 1987, is Michelin Tires. I've worked with them on and off in North America for years. They have a set of values which were created by the Michelin family when the company was founded. Mm -hmm. And they have not, everybody knows it. I have gone to Michelin plants all over. And you know you're in a Michelin plant because I've been to other heavy manufacturing. But you know you're in a Michelin plant. And they treat people a certain way and they care for the community a certain way. And they're not Johnny come lately to the environment. They've been worried about the environment ever since they were founded. So if they change that all of a sudden, there's going to be retirees that will revolt. So what happens when a new CEO comes in, like Nordelli to Home Depot and thinks he can change the values and change everything, the employees quickly came to the conclusion, we don't bleed orange anymore. We don't like being treated this way. Mm -hmm. And they started from an organization that never, that improved its bottom line for 22 consecutive years. They started losing money on their Nordelli. Why? Because the employees weren't responding the way they respond. They lost their focus. They lost their passion. They lost their energy. They lost their level of customer service. And as the founders of Home Depot say, we'll take care of our associates and we will treat them right because they will then do the same to our customers. Mm -hmm. And they're back. They've, They've come back to the old behaviors. So, David, I loved, as I read through the book, the connections that you make between the the values of an organization, the vision that it has for the future, the culture and the behaviors that it demonstrates, the impact it has for leadership, leadership succession, and most importantly of all, to business success and the results. So for people listening to this conversation where we've piqued their curiosity about, well, do we have corporate values? If we do, are we articulating the behaviors appropriately? Are we demonstrating them consistently? How can people learn more about the critical business imperative that the values bring? How do they learn more about you and the work that you're doing? Well, they can always reach out to me at our website um, or email me. The reality is is that um, the best way to learn about these I'll give, I give away my secrets. Consultants don't like this for me, but I call them corporate legends. What are those stories that employees tell each other about what Mary did? We don't know when Mary did it. We don't even know if Mary was her name. But there's this story of somebody in our organization who did A, B, and C in a difficult situation. And as a result of that, probably saved our business. She did it because she acted this way. And those corporate legends are uh, examples of the value behaviors. And the more corporate legends you get, collect, the more you begin to see the thread of behavior in them, of what differentiates people living the values versus people don't live the values. And you now, we have to remember oral history is the strongest way. Telling stories is the strongest way to get people emotionally involved and understand what those values in the organization are. So how do you capture that oral history? How do you understand it? And the other thing which I say, which refers back to Home Depot, is I often say to the leadership that this is a back to the future exercise. Your organization at one point was great because you had a great culture. And how do you know? Now, here's something which I 
you know, I kind of borrow from Edgar Schein is, he was asked once, how do I know, how do you measure, how do you know a company has a great culture? He said, are they executing their strategy, making a profit and their employees are stable and happy? So that's the other thing you have to understand. What's the right behavior for one organization is not going to be the right behavior for another. And you can't impose, and that's why I have a problem with best places to work, because you can't impose the value set. And I look at this list, for instance, Google. Google doesn't treat their women in the organization very nice. In fact, two years ago, there was a whole protest at the annual meeting about the treatment of women being underpaid, et cetera. The, I was sort of vindicated when I always talk about Google in a negative way, which people don't like to hear. Um, and the global executive vice president of uh, government relations had resigned and wrote an article which detailed how Google doesn't live its values and it doesn't live its purpose statement of to do no harm. Well, employees know that. But they join the organization thinking it does no harm, thinking it lives its values. And then all of a sudden, no, it's not a meritocracy at all. Because if you're not an engineer producing innovative ideas for them, you're not going to get recognized or promoted. And by the way, if you're in human resources or something else, forget about it because you're a cost center. Even though you probably brought all those people on that are successful and did all these things to make the organization successful. So to answer that question is, how do you know it? You've got to look at this as a business case. What happens when organizations live their values, their employees are consistent? Of course, your values and your culture is the foundation for your employee experience. And unless you have a positive employee experience, I don't care how many parties and sleep pods you have, you're not going to have a good employee engagement. Because if your management is not treating employees right, the same day you had this great festival under the guise of employee engagement, and everybody went home happy, and you get home, what's the first, and your significant other, where kids ask you, how was work today, daddy? And the first thing you think about is the way you were treated lousy by your boss, not the party you had. It's the employee experience that drives engagement, but too many organizations aren't focused on holding people accountable to the behaviors. And when you do, you're successful. Another example I have in the book is Engel and Boehringer in Canada. After we did their values, I got a phone call from the CEO saying, you just saved this two and a half hour conversation at the annual executive meeting because we realized why we always turn down doing something in bovine medicine. It doesn't fit our purpose and our values. But every year we spend two and a half hours on it. But now that we actually understand this more, we're not going to do it this year. Thank you. You saved us two and a half hours. So values have a, they're more important than you think they are. Well, I think you put that comment in the book as well, that um, values will undermine strategy um, all the time. It's the how work gets done. And so, David, I appreciate you and your time and sharing you. your today and I'll make sure that the information about the book your website etc is included in the show notes okay. around this video thank you thank you very much it was a pleasure thank you so much for joining Morag today if you enjoyed the show please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing if you learned something worth sharing share it cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.